I'd like to welcome those of you that are listening through Facebook. We're doing a greeting time right now. So we will get started with the word here in just a moment. But thank you for joining us this morning. May God richly bless you and strengthen you and encourage your hearts uh, and your lives this morning as we share the word. We're going to be in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 if you want to prepare yourselves as you listen to this message this morning. Praise God. Our children can be dismissed to go to uh, Children's Church at this time. We're going to get into the Word. If you want, uh, turn with me in your Bibles this morning to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I've titled this message this morning, Eternal Blessings. Praise God. We have blessings that God has given to us here on this earth. Aren't you thankful for those? Amen. Amen. But we have eternal blessings, something that we get to look forward to, uh, something that God is is, uh, preparing for us. It says that Jesus went away to prepare a place for us, uh, and we get that to look forward to. We've got, uh, uh, can you imagine, you know, it took him six days to make this earth and all of the universe. What has he been doing preparing a place for us all of this time? It's going to be a wonderful place that we have in store. But... Uh, I'm going to begin here. Uh, we're going to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and we're going to begin there. I want to start with a word of prayer. I want you to remember uh, Ruth in prayer this morning. She's been dealing with some problems with sodium in her body, uh, Ruth Evans, and uh, continue to uphold her in prayer. Others that are in need this morning, but we're, we're just going to pray for that and pray for, continue to pray for Don and Elaine Marks. Uh, just strengthen their bodies. They're, you can tell the, the, the strain that's been on their bodies, and they just need a real touch from the Lord today. Father, we're just so thankful for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you for your provision that you've given us through the cross this morning. We thank you, Lord, that you bore the, uh, the stripes across your back for healing in our bodies. And Lord, we ask, dear Lord, that you would just continue to intervene and and minister, and as we have faith, Lord, bring forth healing and health and wholeness into bodies today, dear God. We we ask, Lord, that you would be with Ruth Evans, dear God, that you would lift her up and encourage her, bless and strengthen her physically, and we pray for answers that, Lord, they, they might be able to find out exactly what is taking place and what is causing this issue within this body. For Don and Elaine, we lift them to you. We ask the Lord for continued strength in both Don and Elaine's bodies, that you would continue to encourage their hearts and their lives. And I do pray also for my mother-in-law, Dorothy, this morning. Father, that you would bless and strengthen her and her weakened condition right now. And we just ask, dear God, for this healing in her body. And Lord, as she goes for uh, a further uh, test on uh, the 13th of this month, we ask, Lord, that you would just uh, be with her and encourage her. We pray for wisdom and, and insight from the doctors, Lord, that you would just direct them and strengthen them as they make decisions with regards to her situation. We give you thanks now for all that you're doing and all that you will continue to do here today. In Jesus' mighty name we pray it. Amen. Now, if you will, take your Bibles. We're going to look at at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning in the first verse. It says, Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we can commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, But Jesus Christ is Lord in ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this 
All surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal bodies. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. It is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. Since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with, with you to himself. And this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow in the glory, to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that your word shall not return void. And that, Lord, as this word goes forth this morning, that it would touch hearts and it would do the work in each heart and each life that you desire to do. We give you thanks and we give you praise. We pray your anointing upon the ears of the hearer, anointing upon your servant as he brings forth your word this morning. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. Praise God. 2 Corinthians 4.1 says, Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. We have a ministry. According to 2 Corinthians 3.18 we are to reflect the Lord's glory. That's to be her reflection. You know, when you look in the, in the mirror, you see a reflection. Do we see Christ? Do others see Christ in us? We're to reflect the glory of God. The presence of God in our lives should reflect his glory. And we are to be transformed into the likeness of his glory. So are we being transformed? Have we allowed the Holy Spirit to continue to work in us each and every day? Are we being transformed according to the scriptures as we have surrendered our hearts and our lives to him? He is still working on each and every one of us. Second Corinthians 4, 4 again says the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. You see, this age that we're a part of has optic problems today. They don't see. They don't see and they don't understand it's a problem with spiritual vision and blinded minds, and they're not seeing the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. People who should see the glory of God, people that should comprehend the gospel of Christ, they've been blinded by the evil one, and they've been deceived by the evil one. Jesus, in his earthly ministry, told us something about where this type of thing comes from. In John 10.10, 10, he says, the thief comes only to do what? but to steal and to kill and destroy. And I have come that you might have life and that you might have it to the full. So we know that the enemy is about bringing destruction to your life and to mine. We have a declared enemy and we're living in a time that is, I think, a grander scale than we've probably ever seen. We're seeing more and more in our society today, in America today, than we ever have. And it's fueled by the destroyer. Today, almost everything that God has done, everything has, and almost all the truths he has declared are being under attack today. And we see it from the book of Genesis and through the book of Revelation, but mostly the book of Genesis and also the book of Revelation, the two books that are under the greatest attack. The God of this age has blinded unbelievers. Well, God is the designer. He created everything. He created it with order. What do we see today? We see Darwinism on the rise. We see more and more people that say there isn't a God. They deny it completely that God didn't design anything. Again, we look at a building that is built and people will look at that in essence and what they're looking at and saying, well, there wasn't anybody that built that. It just came into being. They deny the existence of God and so they're attacking the book of Genesis today. His order, the order of the Lord was seen from the very beginning. 
including the crowning creation of man and of woman. And we see the attack that is taking place there today also. We see men that, that want to be women and women that want to be men. We see that, that, that they're, they're not accepting of those things. We see the attack that is taking place in our society today on the marriage, which God ordained in the book of Genesis for Adam and Eve to join together and be one. And the attack on marriage today is, is outrageous. And what is taking place in our society today when it deals with males? It, it, or it, with marriage, in male and female, and he designed a way for them to do life together. I'm so thankful for the marriage relationship that God has given to us, but it is be, being destroyed in our society today. We see it over and over again. We see the rate of divorce that has continued to increase in our society. And it's just as high, according to the statistics, in the church today as it is in the world. And so the enemy is creeping in. The enemy is trying to do everything that he can to bring destruction to what God has designed and what he has put together. Those ideas from God and his origin design are under attack today. And I think they're under attack like never before in our society. When people reject God, when people turn their backs on him, they re soon reject the truths of how he designed and made everything and everything in creation. And that's what begins to happen. They don't, they don't accept those things. How many of us have listened to something on the radio or on the television and we begin to shake our heads and can't believe that they are saying those certain things? It, it is, is mind boggling that they don't believe the truth of what the gospel is. And they wanna believe the lie of, of the fact that the universe just happened to come into being. You know, these lies that are perpetrated and are blinded, see, it's the, the scripture says that the enemy will blind the eyes of the unbeliever. Rejection of God and his truths always lead to delusion and to debased thinking. We need to understand that there are those out there that don't believe what you do. How many of you have ever been attacked for your Christian faith? Raise your hand. People that have said things about you and against you, we see it more and more, and we're gonna see it more and more in our society as the day draws near. The truth is attacked and it's destroyed. The truth teller is, is bitterly opposed and then he's just canceled out. They just try to remove him from their thinking in any way whatsoever in our society today. No one respects uh, that are living according to, to the world. No one respects the gospel anymore and those that are living for Christ. Anything not a part of the anti-God uh, anti narrative is rejected. And so we're seeing that in our society in greater and greater ways in America, the nation that is one nation under God. We're seeing these things be continually being pulled down in our society today. We're called to shine though, like Christ's light. You and I have been called to be a light in the darkness. You and I have been called as, as believers in Jesus Christ to be that light in a dark world. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 through 8, again, it says, For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair. We experience all life throws at us. You know, we're all gonna get older. We're all feeling the effects of getting older. As we get older, our bodies begin to wear out, but aren't you glad that there's something else that's taking place in us? There's something that God is doing in us and is preparing us for eternal blessings that he has in store for us. He's continually transforming us. He does not take away the great truth that, it, that Jesus Christ is the light of the world. Jesus is that light. And in you lives Christ. And so you and I are to be that example. We are to be that witness. We've talked several, over the last several months about inviting somebody to come to the house of God or sharing the gospel with someone, expressing that love. In cl Sunday school class this morning, Vivian brought up about sharing if, if I found somebody that didn't know the Lord Jesus Christ as their savior and, and it was just me and them, would I be able to explain to them, they never heard about Jesus, could I explain to them the truth of this gospel? 
Can you share that with somebody? Have you ever been able to explain to them how Jesus loved them, how he died for them on the cross? Are we willing to share the gospel with those that God has placed in our path? Are we bold enough? You know, we need that encouragement from the Holy Spirit to help us and strengthen us in those times. But we experience these things in our lifetime. Look at verse 16 of chapter 4 of Corinthians there with me. And I'm going to read into verse chapter 5 and verse 1. It says, therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Now we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Now these are earthly tents that we live in. They're earthly tents. They're not our lasting focus. How many of you uh, take vitamins? How many of you eat properly every day? That's uh, okay. I, I got a few of these, but nobody else is willing to raise their hand. You know, these bodies are going to wear out. I, you know, you can eat properly every single day. You can take vitamins all you want. You can eat the right foods. But one day this body is going to wear out. This body is going to die. This is the tent that God has given to us for right now. You know, when I think of a tent, how many of you have ever slept in a tent that had holes in it and it rained? I remember one of the first camping trips we took with our family. We went with another couple and uh, we borrowed a tent from the church in Orville at the time. And we put that tent up and it rained that whole night. Everybody except me ended up in the car sleeping. And it kept dripping on my face and I'd move over here. And before you know it, you know, the whole floor ends up getting wet. Not a good thing. But see, our tents wear out. This body is going to wear out. It's going gonna, it's gonna to fall apart eventually. And it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to be eventually buried into the ground. And so what do we have? We have this tent. Whose maker and builder is the Lord? Because we have an eternal home, he is the maker he is creating and working for us right now. It says that he's gone to prepare a place for you and I. We have an eternal home and we're going to get new bodies one day. Amen. Praise the Lord. New bodies. So 2 Corinthians 5, 9 through 10 says this. So we make it our goal to please him. Now, this is important for us. We make it our goal to please him. The scripture says whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. You see, the life that you live today will determine your life in eternity. That life that you're living now is going to determine what you're going to live like when you get into eternity. And so the way that we spend our time, the way that we, we think, the way that we act, the things that we do for others, the blessings that, that God has given to us, how are we dealing with those? How do we, what do we do with those blessings that God has placed within our hands? You see, the idea of heavenly rewards was, recre was created uh, from the very heart of God. Heavenly rewards that are given to us. In, verse, in, in 1 Corinthians 15 and 58, it says this, Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. You see, our level and our degree of faithfulness here on this earth is going to, is going to determine our eternal blessings. The eternal blessings that God has in store for you and I are determined by the faithfulness that you and I have here upon this earth and the way that we live. We say that, uh, you know, I, I know the Lord and, 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 and I love him. Are we serving him? Are we giving, him to the, giving ourselves to the work of the kingdom? You see, from Genesis to Revelation, the message is God has a reward awaiting the righteous. We see it all through the passages of Scripture. Just a couple of verses in Psalm 62, 12, it says, you, your reward, you, you reward everyone according to what they have done. 
You record, you're gonna, he's going to reward everyone according to what they've done. And then also in, in Proverbs eleven eighteen it says, A wicked person earns deceptive wages, but the one who sows righteousness reaps a sure reward. God has a reward in store for each of us as we continue in doing the will of God. Romans 2, 6 says, God will give to each person according to what he has done. According to what he has done. You know, when you do a job, you expect to get paid for it, don't you, here on this earth? But sometimes we do things for charity, but other times we're working our job and we expect to get paid for that. There's a reward for the labor that we put forth. In the same way, the, the labor that the Lord has given us to do as believers here upon this earth, we are to do with diligence. And there's a reward awaiting you and I. Jesus, when, when, when you give, when you pray, when you fast, your Father who is in heaven sees those things that you've done in secret and he says he will reward you for that. You know, sometimes we do things so that others might see us. We get our glory right then. If we're doing things because we want others to see us, if we're doing the, the reason that we're touching somebody or ministering to somebody has to do with the fact that we want others to see us then we've received all the glory that we're going to receive. But if we do those things and not expecting glory here upon this earth, but doing it as loving unto the Lord, then he's going to bless us. How many of you know you're going to be rewarded for the time that you spend in prayer? As you pray for people, as you pray for hearts and lives, you're going to be rewarded. As you, as you spend time in fasting before the Lord, the Lord's going to reward you for that. There'll be a reward for those things. Matthew 16, 27 says, For the Son of Man is is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what he has done. So according to everything that you and I have done. Now, I don't know about you. There's times that I have to ask myself. I'm sure none of you have to do that. I have to ask myself, why am I doing this? Am I doing it so that I get a benefit back for myself? Or am I doing it as unto the Lord? And I, I, I do. I ask myself, what is my purpose? What is my reason for doing this? Why do I want to touch that person and minister to that person? Is there an ulterior motive that I have in doing that? You know, we see a lot of times people do something for someone else and because they get something back from it. They're going to re- receive something for it. You know, my motive behind ministering to the lives of people should be maybe... Uh, to, to bless God and to honor God and to bring glory to his name. And as we do that, again, we are building up rewards for ourselves in heaven. For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person, each person, according to what he has done. You know, it's amazing to me that God knows everything that you and I have done, everything. There's nothing that slips his mind Everything. You know, as we get older, how many of you forgot something this week? Anybody? (laughs) The Lord never forgets. He's able to hold on to everything. He can remember everything. The one thing he can forget, praise the Lord, is anything that's under the blood. Amen? It says that he forgets it. It's as far as the east is from the west. Praise the Lord. When we put it under the blood, when we've asked for cleansing, he forgives us. You see, it's going to be worth it all. It's going to be worth it all when we see Jesus. The time of rewards is coming for you and I as we serve him faithfully. These rewards should motivate us. They are waiting for us as we are faithful, as we are faithful and as we give glory to the Lord. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says this, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this, not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. How many of you know our works don't save us? Nothing. Those things do not not save us. It's by faith that I'm saved and I receive Christ. Yet they testify, these these, uh, works, they testify that we have been saved and that Christ is alive in us. It's those gifts, it's those those, uh, works that we do, those things where we touch the lives of somebody else, it shows that Christ is at work in our lives. And so as we reach out, as we minister to somebody else, that is the testimony of the power of God working in us and through us to do that great work. How how do faith and works fit together in our lives? Key one, your belief determines where you will spend eternity. 
Your belief determines where you will spend eternity. So that's my faith, my faith. That determines where my eternity is going to be in Christ. And then secondly though, your behavior determines how you will spend eternity. There's where, and then there's how you're gonna spend your eternity. See, what am I doing with what this great salvation has brought to me? This gift of, that, of salvation that Christ has given to me, how am I using that to advance the kingdom's work? How am I using that to touch the lives of people around me? We are not saved by what we do, but by what Christ has done for us. And I thank the Lord for that because it's by his grace that we've been saved. And it's his grace that keeps us. Our belief causes us to act on our faith, though. It causes us to act. Those are those acts of, of love and joy and peace and long-suffering and, and, and gentleness and goodness that we exhibit unto others and we minister unto others. Those actions do not go unnoticed, but they will, re, they will result in eternal rewards. Christ sees them. God sees those things that you're doing in this flesh. You see, salvation comes by belief. I believe in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I've received him into my heart and into my life. I've asked him to forgive me of my sins. I believe that he is the Savior of the world. I believe that he is the Son of God. I believe he's a part of the three in one, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I believe and I have faith and I receive that into my heart and into my life. But rewards come by my behavior, by my behavior. And praise God, you know, even if you didn't receive anything when you got to heaven, it's still going to be a glorious place. But God has rewards that he set up as we are righteous, as we are faithful to him. You see, faith determines where we spend eternity and works determine how we spend eternity in this life. Eternal destination is determined by belief. Do you believe this morning that he is the son of God? Have you asked him to come into your heart and into your life and by faith received him? so that you can have this great salvation. But then also we know that eternal compensation is determined by behavior, by the behavior that we, we exhibit now after we've received him into our hearts and into our lives. Redemption comes from Christ's work for us. He redeemed us because of his work, but now because he lives in us, rewards come from our works for Christ. What are we doing for the work of the kingdom? Are we ministering to the lives of people around us? Are we touching lives? And you know, we all have a place. Brenda mentioned it this morning in Sunday school. She, she was talking about it. You might be a mother. You might be somebody that's making cookies for somebody. It might be little, but whatever it is that God has given you to do, do it with all of your heart. Do it with faith and, and understanding that you're ministering to the lives of people around you and God has given you that opportunity. It might be that you've been a great mother and minister to your children. It might be that you've been a great father and you've ministered to your children, but it's touching the lives of people that God has placed in your path. Who will be judged? Scripture says that all believers are going to be judged one day. All believers at the judgment seat of Christ. Romans 14, 10 says, you then, why do you judge your brother or why do you look down on your brother? For we, for we will all stand before God's judgment seat. There's not one of us that will miss out on that as believers in Christ. I guarantee you it's much better to be at the judgment seat than it is to be at the great white throne. Because we are going to all be judged. Every person will be judged. Romans 14, 12 says, so then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Give an account. You know, I've shared this before. I remember playing ping pong with one of my, uh, well, one of the kids that was older than me in, in high school, and I'd miss, miss a, a shot. And, oh, man. And after a while, he started saying, he says, what's the matter? Is your dad here or something? No, he wasn't. My heavenly father was, though. And he was listening. In other words, why weren't you cussing? Because he'd miss it, and he'd cuss up a storm. You know, the Lord is watching us. He's watching everything that we do, and, and we're to give an account for that. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due for him, due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. 
We're all going to stand before the judgment. Every person, every individual will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. When does this judgment take place? Scripture says when the Lord returns, when the Lord comes. In, in 1 Corinthians 4, 5, it says, Therefore judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait till the Lord comes. Wait till the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of men's hearts. At that time, each one will receive his praise from God. So what is, what is our motive for the things that we do? And I think we need to ask ourselves that at times. I think there are times that our motives are selfish. I think we have to be honest with ourselves. There are times that we have to, hey, man, I, I, I've got to pull back. I've got to realize I'm doing this for a wrong reason. And so I have to continually ask myself, Lord, help me, strengthen me, live in me, walk in me, help me and strengthen me, O Holy Spirit, every day. You see, on that day, everything that we have done will be approved for a reward. In 1 Corinthians 3, verses 12 through 15, it says, if, if one man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is. Because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test, and, and test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through flames. You see the rewards awaiting as a consequence of the judgment. Those rewards that God has for us. You know, I look forward to that day when we get to go to heaven. Praise God. We have an opportunity here on this earth to show forth our love to the Lord in the things that we do for him in ministering the gospel unto others. You see, based on our reward, God who is faithful and good, that's what, what God gives to us. Based on that reward, whatever we've done, either good or bad, he's going to judge that. So what are we doing for the work of the kingdom? Are we touching the lives? Folks, we have it so good here in America. We, we have been blessed in so many ways. Uh, I want you to ask yourself the question, when was the last time uh, you asked somebody to come to church? When was the last time that you talked to somebody about the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, I'm living example. Yes, you are a living example, but there comes a time where we have to speak forth. Folks, if we're going to reach people for Christ, we have to begin to speak to them and talk to them. You say, well, when a crisis comes, they'll come because they know I'm stable in my walk and my relationship with the Lord. Well, why not talk to them now? We need to become more and more evangelistic in our relationship that, that Christ has given us. Are we touching lives? And again, there are other ways we can benefit by blessing them, making a meal when somebody is sick and, and touching them, ministering to a neighbor that is in need at a time when, when, when maybe nobody else sees, but you see it and you have an opportunity to share the gospel with them and open that door. You see, those who have been faithful seeking the Lord will be rewarded as we seek the Lord. I believe God has rewards for each of us and, and those things are in store. This reward is where righteousness pays off. Proverbs eleven eighteen says, the wicked man earns deceptive wages, but he who sows righteousness reaps a sure reward. So are we sowing righteousness? Scripture says we're, he's not going to be mocked. That which we sow, we're going to also reap. And so praise God as we sow, as we minister unto others. You see, the, the, the awards uh, of the Lord uh, are great indeed. Genesis 15, 1 says this. He says, after this, the word of the Lord came to Abraham, Abram in a vision. He says, do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. You know, reward enough is to see Jesus. That's going to be wonderful. But he wants us to be righteous. And when we've accepted him and received him into our hearts, he wants us to live for him. These heavenly rewards are assured for God's earthly servants. They're assured for us as we serve him and as we live and walk in righteousness. There was a proportion to what you have done. They are in proportion. 1 Corinthians 3, 8 says, The man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose, and each will be rewarded according to his own labor. You know, 
Some of you maybe have never won a soul to the Lord Jesus Christ personally. You may have never prayed with them the sinner's prayer. But that doesn't mean that you haven't done something to touch their life. You may be the one that is maybe planting a seed in their life. You might be the one that's watering that seed and preparing it for a harvest by the way that you're living, by the righteous walk that you live and people that see that. You know, uh, you're a testimony as a believer when you get up and go to church on Sunday and people in your neighborhood see you leaving for church. That's a testimony. That's an example. You're a testimony when you're on the, in the workplace and at lunchtime you take, the mo- take a moment and bow your head and say a word of prayer over your meal and pray for your fellow workers that might be there. You are an example and a testimony in your neighborhood when you maybe mow the grass for somebody that is sick or hurting or has been injured or maybe they're on vacation and, and, and you have the opportunity to help them out. You can be a testimony in so many ways and be an example, but you might be the one that's watering that seed. You may not be the one that brings it to fruit, but that doesn't mean we don't say, hey, I'm gonna take the opportunity to at least ask this person to share with them the gospel of Jesus Christ so that they might come to know him as Lord and Savior. You see, those rewards are gonna be enjoyed in this life ahead. Matthew 16, 27 says, For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what he has done. This is going to happen when Christ comes back. 2 Corinthians 4, 17. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. What kind of troubles are you going through? Difficulties. Health issues as we get older. Um, This body's wearing out, folks. This body is going to fall apart eventually. But what you're doing for the Lord will stand and stand for all of eternity because there's going to be rewards for you. There are going to be rewards, I think, at the judgment seat, but I think there's going to also be regrets things that we know that we probably should have done. We even know them now. There are things that we've maybe missed, opportunities that we've missed. But that doesn't mean we can't start today and say, today I'm going to make every opportunity count. I'm going to look for those opportunities to share this gospel with others around me, to be a testimony, to say the right words. You know, sometimes... I'm around uh, individuals that don't know how to hold their tongue. They lose it, and the words that come out of their mouth are not pleasing to listen to. It's very difficult when you, when you come across that. If we join in with them, what kind of a testimony does that give? We need to, we need to stand firm in our, in our walk and our relationship with the Lord. It's so easy in our society today to compromise and to go the way of the world. It always has been. That's the easier route. It is more difficult to serve the Lord and to live for Him, especially when, as, as Christians today, and more and more we're going to see it as we continue to press in, and as the closer we see the coming of the Lord, it's going to become more and more difficult as believers in Christ because the enemy is going to try to attack you and I over and over again. And so we need to stand firm. We need to stand firm. 1 Corinthians 3, 14 and 15 says, If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. Will we regret some of the things that we've done? I'm sure there are going to be some regrets for us. But those are things that we can rectify, things that we can change now, that we need to ask the Lord to cleanse us, to forgive us, and to give us strength now to stand in righteousness. You know, there are crowns. What are some of the crowns? A crown of joy, a crown of righteousness, 2 Timothy 4.8, the crown of life, James 1.12, the crown of glory, 1 Peter 5.4, the crown of uh, of the imperishable, 1 Corinthians 9.25. The scripture talks about not losing your crown. Don't lose your crown. 
Revelations 311. Uh, I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. Take your crown. How many of you know the enemy is going to attack and try to pull Christians away in the last days? He's going to do everything that he can. As I've read this book uh, from the voice of the martyrs and, and, and I see uh, the individuals that stood, but some in those congregations, in those groups, that when they, the persecution came, they turned away from serving the Lord. Their heart wasn't truly sold out to God. And others that stood firm, even in the midst of persecution, even in the midst of losing their families, even in the midst of, uh, of prison and sometimes beatings, over and over again, uh, being uh, left in, in a cell for, for days upon days with no food. They didn't give up. They didn't lose heart. Are we going to stand firm in the time of tribulation, in the time of trouble, in the time of difficulty in our lives? A great time of, of worship involving these crowns is coming. In Revelations 4, 10, and 11, it says this, The 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Brother Miller, my professor in, of psychology in college, in Bible college, used to tell the story of the thimble crown. What are you going to have to throw at the feet of Jesus? What are you going to have to lay at the altar at the feet of Jesus when that day comes? Is it going to be a thimble crown? One that you have on your finger, or is it going to be a crown that you can actually take and put at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ? You see, we have our salvation through faith, but what we do with what Christ has given to us shows forth the testimony of, of the working of Christ within our lives. What are the rewards? Privileges for the faithful. God's blessing and privileges, perks that are set aside. Special treatment for those that are righteous. Praise to the faithful. Matthew 25, 21 says, His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. How many of us want to hear, Well done, thou good and faithful servant, when we get to heaven? Amen? Serving the Lord, giving Him everything. Position of authority for the faithful. Scripture says, You have been faithful with a few things, and I will put you in charge of many things. How many of you know you're not going to be sitting on a cloud in heaven just doing nothing, playing some harp. I believe there's going to be a lot of rejoicing to start with, a lot of rejoicing, but God's going to have something for us to do. We're going to be active. We're going to be busy. You know, uh, yesterday was a, uh, a day that uh, was kind of nice. Didn't have any more ball games, although I miss them, Addison and Larissa, going to watch your, your, your games and things. But it was kind of nice. I had a Saturday that was kind of free, and Addison's been cutting my lawn for me. Praise the Lord. <laughs> and I didn't have to, to work in the yard, and it was kind of relaxing. But you know what? After a while, not having anything to do, it was nice for a while, but then it's like, got to find something to do. Got to do something. Just don't want to just sit all day. Want to do something. You know, when we get to heaven, God's going to have something for us to do. You're not going to be bored when you get to heaven. Amen? We're going to have something that we get to do, praise the Lord. Now, we have seen that obedience does count. What we do now does matter. What we do with this salvation that has been given to us does matter. We make it our ambition to please the Lord. We need to do all that we can, while we can, for the Lord. Praise God. How many of you know you can't take your financial blessings with you to heaven either? Amen. So we are to give unto the Lord, give faithfully unto the Lord of what he has blessed us with and, and share it with the work of the kingdom. We are to be obedient in that. And I believe there's great reward in store for those that have been faithful with their giving unto the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 9, and 10 says, so we make it our goal to please him. I like that. We make it our goal. Is that your goal? To please the Lord every day that you get up. To please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it, for we must all appear before the judgment seat, that each one may receive what is due him for the things he has done while in the body, whether good or bad. 
So we have a goal. We have a goal. How many of you have a goal this morning? To please the Lord. Do you have a goal to please Him? To please Him? We are also to reflect His glory. We are to reflect His glory. There should be a reflection that comes forth that, that the glory of God is coming out from us and we're to reflect that. And then to be transformed into His likeness. That should be every one of our desire because as long as we're here, we're not going to be quite like Him. It says when we see Him, we'll be like Him. But we are to work on that while we're here, amen? We are to be working towards that transformation, allowing the Holy Spirit to change us, to renew us, to refresh us, to, 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 to convict us when conviction is necessary in our hearts and in our lives. We need that conviction so that the Holy Spirit... And don't reject it. Don't keep holding on. When the Holy Spirit begins to convict, we need to be obedient and change that action and do what God has told us. It will be worth it all. It will be worth it all when we see him, if we'll live according to his word. Praise God. Bow your heads with me this morning. Are you struggling this morning in, in your walk, in your relationship with Christ today? Is there some areas in your life that you say, man, you know, the Lord has convicted me in this. There's some things that I've been very inappropriate in, in things that I've just been complacent in, in my walk, and my relationship with Him. Maybe it's even your prayer time. Maybe it's, it, it's your, your time in, in God's Word. Uh, maybe it's just the motives that you have sometimes when you do things for others and the way that you minister. And, and it, it's your desire to receive something. And, and what's your motive behind it? And you would say, Pastor, please, I, I need prayer this morning. I need prayer. Is there anyone that would say, Pastor, please keep me in prayer? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your faith, for your honesty and your openness this morning. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Glorious Lord. Praise God. Father, I believe in our lives there are areas of shortcomings for each of us, Lord. We are to examine those on a daily basis. And Lord, you see these hands that were raised this morning. and You see what they're facing, what they're going through. You see the struggles. You see the areas that maybe they have been complacent in, maybe. And for all of us at times, I think we can have a tendency to become complacent. It's, it's our human nature. Lord, what are we doing that needs to be changed, Lord, in us? And Lord, each person that raised their hand, they probably had each one of them different reasons for lifting their hand unto you this morning and things that they need to, to maybe make right, things that they need to change. Maybe it's an attitude change that is necessary right now. Maybe it's uh, issues with anger. Maybe it's those things that uh, their tendencies to, to do things that uh, they want to do in their own way and not in the, in the way of, of the Lord, but they want to do them in their own strength, in their own power, and they've not relied on you, Lord, and I pray that you'd help them and strengthen them. Lord, you see their hearts, you see their lives this morning, and as they lift those things to you right now, we just pray for your Holy Spirit to do a work. that the peace of God would rest upon their hearts and upon their minds, that as they surrender their will to yours, that, Lord, you would give them strength because without your strength, without your Holy Spirit, they're not going to be able to, to be overcomers in those areas. And so may they rely on your Holy Spirit. May they be praying daily and praying in the Spirit, Lord. Father, allowing your Holy Spirit to minister and lift them up and encourage them today. Lord, use them for your glory and for your honor. And Father, we'll give you thanks, we'll give you praise for it in the mighty name of Jesus. Go before us now, lead us in all that we say and we do this week. May our lives be uh, a testimony, an example unto others. May we show forth the love of Christ in the way that we act. And Lord, the things that we speak, the things that come forth from our mouths. May we, Father, be 
pleasing to you and even in our own homes, Lord. Our own homes is sometimes the toughest place to show forth the love of Christ. Sometimes we irritate and agitate one another. Lord, help us to bring peace to our homes. Help us to allow your Holy Spirit into our homes and into our families each and every day. Lord, we just give you thanks now for all that you're doing and all that you will continue to do in our hearts and in our lives. We'll never fail to praise you for it in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise God. God bless you. Let somebody know you love them, appreciate them as you leave today. God bless you.